So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this webinar on how to score 760 on the GMAT. My name is Rajat Sudana. I'm one of the co-founders of eGMAT, and I'm going to be your main host today. Supporting me in this webinar is, uh, is Sandeep. Sandeep's a GMAT strategy expert, um, and, and, and he's going to make sure that uh, if you have any question that, that pertains to just your case, those questions get, get answered. Now, the goal of this webinar is to help you kind of define um, a study plan for you to get to, to, to that um, 730, 740, 750, or, or 760 score. Um, I'm going to address many um, misconceptions that people have about the GMAT. I'm going to talk about questions such as how long do I need to, to study for the GMAT? The answer happens to be different for different people. If you go to our YouTube channel, you'll see success stories where people have gone improved in, in 20 days. There, you'd see success stories where people take two months. And you'll also see a few success stories where people have taken years. And we're going to talk about, you know, why does some people take that long and why is it that some people get to their target GMAT score in, 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 in a matter of weeks or months and how can we be more like those people. Um, this is primarily a GMAT strategy webinar which means we will not talk about a whole lot of subject matter stuff. But if you want to know about subject matter stuff, we have a GMAT strategy webinar. It's a wonderful webinar. That's tomorrow. So definitely uh, register for that. You can click on the register now button. We also have a sentence correction webinar next week. Uh, now we'll be solving one sentence correction question today, but again, the intent will not be to teach you how to go about doing it. So the intent is to prove what does GMAT SC test. But again, if you want to learn how to go about solving SC, if you're an eGMAT student and, 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 and you want to get to that next level in that meaning-based approach, definitely register for this one over here. Okay, with that, Let's get to know you guys a bit better. Um, I want to know when do you guys plan to take the GMAT and if you've not taken a date as of yet, you can uh, put in that appropriate response. Then let's kind of talk about what score are you aiming for. And then let me just figure out where you currently are, which is what's your current GMAT score. Now the fun about, about these questions is it tells us this makeup of this group. I have about 130 odd students here in this webinar right now. It tells me, I mean, how many of you are at that 650 level? How many of you are starting from a very low GMAT score? And I'm accordingly, it's just, you know, a certain level of uh, familiar, it, it, it helps me judge, you know, in terms of the familiarity level, what, what to, to what extent are you guys familiar with, 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 with the GMAT? Um, all right, it seems, uh, let's kind of go through this. We have a few folks who plan to take the test right away, but the biggest, two biggest groups, about 73% of you either have upwards of a, a month and a half to 75 days or haven't taken a date as of yet. Um, in terms of your target GMAT score, uh, you know, again, 75% plus are aiming for that score of 730 or higher. That's wonderful. Uh, another 16% in... Um, in that 710, 720 bracket, and about 8% of you are in that 600 to 700 bracket over here. With regards to the current GMAT score, only three of you are in that 710, 720, but then the rest of you have a, um, have, have a fairly long journey to go. We have a, about 10% of you in, in that 600 to 700 as well. That's wonderful. So we're going to have a lot of fun today. So with that, let's go right into the presentation pane as we do that. Let's just, uh, the, the question, uh, um, uh, 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 the, the, the screen will have changed for you. You should be seeing a presentation with a Q&A pod below the presentation. Again, uh, during the webinar, um, one thing I appreciate is if you have questions, put those questions in the Q&A pod. The second thing that I truly appreciate is try and, 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 you know, if you have a question about the content that I'm talking about, I'd love to respond to that question. But if you have a question that's very specific to your case, please reserve it towards the end. I'd, you know, I'd be happy to address those, but typically if question, there are questions which pertain more to your case, then I'd need more information from you before I, I, I can provide a, a useful response to you guys. Okay. So, if you are here in this session, if you're motivated, clearly you're motivated to, to, to rally as the GMAT, otherwise you won't be here uh, on a Saturday evening, then, then I want to make sure that you guys do this. You aim for that GMAT score of, of, of 730 or higher. That's, that's very, very important that, that I want to make sure that you do. Why is that important? Why? Because there are three reasons that you should do that. One is 
B schools need that score. I mean, most B schools are are, are now you know they 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 give you extra brownie points if you get to the score of seven thirty or higher. The second thing, which is which is there is, you look at scholarships, and I'm sure many of you want to get to scholarships or, or want scholarships for yourself. Um, B schools give out a ton of scholarship money, especially U.S. and European B schools, and and most of that scholarship money goes to people who get to that score of seven, ten or higher. Okay. Um, and then the third and probably the most ignored reason is is this: when you look at the delta in total earnings over a ten-year period, um, uh, you know that's the and you compare students graduating from a tier one versus a tier two school, that's the highest that it has ever been in the in the last fifteen years of of what I know of this industry. Okay, here's some data to 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 uh, 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 to showcase over here as to where the median scores went. You can really see two things. One is, you know, everything's everyone's kind of trying to get to that 730 mark, give or take a few points here or there. The second thing is, no Harvard, no Stanford here. Why? Because even in in 2014, th their median scores were around that mark over there. Uh, a few schools um, that give out a bit more details. So Sloan and Columbia, uh, their median scores were were actually, you know, not just the median scores were high, but but they they told us that 80 percent of the admitted class. Uh, had scores of 700 or higher. Essentially, for these two schools, if you don't get a 700, what they're really saying is, um, unless you're a prince of Saudi Arabia, don't bother applying. And and this increase happened despite this decline in test taking population. Okay, now this trend actually continues. So whatever happens with top schools, if you're applying, planning to apply to a tier two school, um, you know the same thing happens over there as well. The four black dots are are what I call as tier two schools, and you can really see that five year change is pretty significant over here. Okay, so this is statistical data, some anecdotal data over here. Um, one of our former students, Nishant, you know, scored a 690, was rejected by every school he applied to. <coughs> Kellogg is not tier two, Molo. So that's why the, the dots over here are towards tier two. So there's no uh, dot against Kellogg. So just want to make sure. Okay. Um, so Nishant scored a 690, applied to Tuck, uh, Penn, and a bunch, bunch of other schools, was rejected by every school. Now, Tuck and Smeal, two schools that actually provide feedback on your candidacy, even when they reject you, they, they told him, we love your candidacy, your GMAT score is not there. They just point blank told him. Um, and, and, um, and so he improved his score to 740, applied to, again, a bunch of schools. Uh, he got a full ride from Ohio, uh, and he secured an admit with scholarship from Columbia. Of course, he went to Columbia. Uh, Pravi, 680, applied to many schools, didn't get a single interview invite, um, worked with us, improved her score to 740. Within seven hours of applying, received five interview invites or so. Uh, so this is, she didn't even apply again, I'm sorry, with a 740. She just updated her score. Within seven hours, she got five interview invites. Again, she got a bunch of scholarships as well. Uh, KKR Krishnakant, uh, this, this is an amazing story. He, even though I just showed these schools over here, he applied to 15 schools, got a reject from every school. I mean, uh, and, and then he improved his, so this was R2 over here, round two. Uh, then he improved his score to 720, applied in round three. This is round three, got five full rides, um, and, 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 and uh, he went to Georgia Tech with, with a full ride overall. Um, um, he actually, we did a second debriefing session with him recently where he talked about how he got an internship, how he got a job with, with Amazon, and, and how he approached networking and all. So, so it's all on our YouTube channel right now. But the bottom line is your GMAT score today is way more important than it has ever been. Why? Because it, it, it acts as a differentiator. I, I don't know why, but schools um, seem to value a 750 more than a 730, a 730 more than a 700. Uh, now... The second reason uh, is why you should really look at is that scholarship money. Again, this is data that you'd probably not find anywhere. But so this three fifty million dollars uh, that that USB schools gave out for merit based scholarships. These are not special interest scholarships. These are merit based scholarships. That's something which is um, which is pretty common out there. But what you won't find is this data a whole lot. Why? Because um, we are the only company that that that. Uh, tabulates this data based on the samples that we get. So based on our estimates. Um, uh, about 55% of, um, of, 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 the, of this amount, which is about, amounts to about 180 million, goes to students who get to that score of 740 or higher. And pretty much all of it goes to folks who get to that 710 or higher score. Which means 
hey, if you get to that score of 740 or higher, this kind of is the medium scholarship amount that you should be getting. And uh, based on my experience of, of having spoken with to thousands and thousands of students, there are two factors that, that decide scholarship. One is your GMAT score. The second is your likability during the interview. Um, again, so that was some statistical data. Let's kind of talk about anecdotal data over here. Mansi, uh, well, scored a 770, caught into pretty much every school she applied to. Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, Kellogg, and NC. Um, she got about $90,000 scholarship from, from Harvard. Victor, uh, um, again, very similar. Uh, uh, got a full ride from, from Ross and Keenan Flagler. Kong Bui, his story is again very similar to Krishna's story. He scored a 760, got five full rides. Uh, he went to Ohio Fisher um, as well. Now this guy got a very special scholarship where not only he got a full ride, but he was paid $1,700 a month as living expenses by Ohio Fisher. Um, uh, again, we talked about these three guys, so um, but you can see the scholarship amounts over there. A couple of other very interesting students. So Ayush, one of our former students, scored a 710, applied to, to Ross and Columbia. Uh, really well in the interview, really connected with the interviewer. But, you know, post applying in round two, he was waitlisted. And, and, and so the guy was shocked. He said, hey, you know, this I didn't expect this at all. So he reached out to the school and said, I thought we really connected during the interview. What happened? So the schools told him, he said, hey, um, you know, we love your candidacy, but as an Indian male, you know, uh, someone from a tech se sector, 710 is not good enough. You've got to improve your GMAT score. So he improved his GMAT score to 750. He didn't even apply again. Uh, he just updated that score and converted those wait lists into admits with scholarship over here. And again, right now we are at about 140. So this number 130 was, was last month. We are at about 144 such success stories on, on our YouTube channel. If you get to our YouTube channel, you can actually see each of these success stories and each one of them has a very unique journey with regards to how how, how they go about uh, 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 essentially how they went about improving and here's a link to that youtube channel that you can get to and this is a quote by john fuller he says that someone with a 770 is way more likely to get that financial award why because the business school wants to buy that high gmat score now let's talk about the third reason over here. The third reason is 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 the difference in total earnings. Uh, this is something which a lot of people don't appreciate, um, and this number has been going up. In, in fact, even this number is is a pessim pessimistic estimate of the delta. So I'm comparing two schools over here, Babson and MIT. Babson, by the way, is the school that I went to. I got a full ride from Babson. That's the world's number one school in entrepreneurship. MIT, of course, is MIT. Now, both these schools are in Boston. They're about 20 miles apart um, in the New England area. And about 80% of graduates from, from both these schools get a job in the New England area. Essentially, arguably, so they have access to a similar set of opportunities. But when you look at the base starting salary from Babson, it's way lower than what it is from MIT. If you look at the starting bonus, it's way lower. There's a third component which is not here, which is the starting equity that you get today, which practically is absent in Babson and MIT. That adds another 30 to 40 grand overall. But even if you take that estimate to be 45,000, why? Because you're not going to get a sign-on bonus every every time. That still is about 450k of of net cash difference. It's not even uh, without taking into account any interest or or anything there um, over a 10-year period or so. So just it pays to to get to that high GMAT score. All right, uh, so I think we've talked about this now. Let's talk about what does it take to ace the GMAT, and um, and, and 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 one of the things that uh, I want to make sure that you take away from this session, if if you don't take away anything else, is that um, when it comes to acing the GMAT, this is the first thing you need to do. This accounts for about eighty percent of your GMAT score. A lot of people, when they're preparing for the GMAT, focus on this piece over here, timing. I mean, people sweat over timing way more, way sooner than they should. Timing is important, but but not nearly half as important as building ability. They worry about which section order to choose, which questions to attempt, how many questions am I going to skip? That's something you should worry about in the last 10 days of your test or last 15 days. Timing probably last 20 uh, over there. But what you should worry about for a majority of your preparation and when I say last 20, last 50 hours of your prep, by the way, is what, what it translates into for me. Um, but what you should worry about primarily is building ability. Building ability, learning the right ways to solve questions, 
building consistency, being able to answer medium and difficult questions correctly. Okay. So all of these things, if you're sweating about them today, and if you're just beginning your preparation, if your GMAT score is not 670, then, then don't. Focus on building ability. That's the one thing that I want you to take away from, 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 from today. And, and just to tell you, just to add some weight to it, we have delivered 10x as many success stories as anyone else has. Um, and 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 and, peep, and then you go watch those interviews. They're going to talk about this piece over there. Now, I'm going to prove this point. I'm going to spend about 20 minutes proving this point because this is something that a lot of people don't get right away and they still can't figure out. And 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 for the one, and there are a couple of reasons why 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 this happens. Um, one is that's how we've started. We've uh, in school we want to really do things fast. And the second is, how many of you over here have? at some point or the other prepared for an Indian entrance test called the CAT or even the GRE, the old form of GRE. How many of you have prepared for, for either the, the Indian entrance test called the CAT, which is the Indian equivalent of the GMAT, and, um, in, or, or the flat GRE, the older GRE? About half of you. People who prepare for, 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 for these two tests, they're Timing's kind of one of the more important things. I wouldn't say the same thing if we were preparing for the CAT, but for the GMAT, it's a, it's a completely different ball game. So we're going to talk about this over here. To put this as a framework, let's kind of talk about two things over here. One is what we call as accuracy, and the second is ability. All right. So what is accuracy? You take a quiz, ten question quiz. You get eight out of those ten questions correct. Accuracy is eighty percent. All right. Uh, so essentially, it's a percentage of questions that you get correct, regardless of how easy or, or how difficult those questions are. Okay, Ability, uh, so accuracy is what I call as an absolute number. It, it doesn't compare you with anyone. It just gives you an absolute number in the context of that quiz. Ability is just is a comparative number. It tells you how good you are uh, when compared to other test takers. For example, you may take a quiz, um, a 10 question quiz, and then you may get eight out of those 10 questions, right? You say, hey, my accuracy is 80%. Um, depending on how people execute on that quiz, your ability may be 50th percentile. I mean, probably half the people who take that quiz get eight out of those 10 questions correct. Um, on the other hand, you might take another quiz, you might get six out of those 10 correct, and your ability might be 90th percentile. So again, accuracy, uh, an absolute number, uh, ability, a comparative number. So what we're going to do over here is we're going to simulate how an adaptive test works. The GMAT works in a, in a very similar fashion, not exactly the same way, it's a bit more sophisticated, but we're going to look at how an adaptive test works. And, and, and to do that, uh, what I have is on the y-axis, I have the difficulty level of questions. On the x-axis, I have the question number. So we're going to take case one, we're going to call him student one. Case two, we're going to call him student two over here. And um, and, and, and so it's case one of student one gets the first question. The first question in a typical adaptive test is always of that average difficulty level. You see this average difficulty level line. He gets that question right. He gets the second question, of, which is of a higher difficulty level. You can see that. Why? Because uh, the blue line as it goes from one to two is moving higher on the y-axis. And the higher we go on the y-axis, the more difficult questions become. Then he gets the third question, which is even more difficult. He gets that question wrong. Um, consequently, the fourth question that he gets is of a, you can see this is the fourth question. It's of a difficulty level between question number two and question number three. How do we do that? You draw horizontal lines from here. You can see the fourth question is between these two. Um, he gets the fourth question right uh, 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 because it's slightly easier. Consequently, gets the fifth question, a bit more challenging, gets that fifth question wrong over here. So that's five questions simulated for student one. Let's talk about student two. Student two gets the first question, median difficulty level, uh, gets that wrong, gets then gets the second question, which is easier, gets that right, gets the third question, slightly more challenging, um, gets that wrong, gets the fourth question right, and gets the fifth question right as well. Okay, very simple. At this point, let's kind of pause the test. Let's end the test at this point. If I were to end this test at, at this point, who do you think would be would be doing better? Would it be student one or student two? Who do you think would be doing better? All right. Three, two, and one.
All right. Um, I have some really good questions and I have some really good responses here. Thank you. Harshad says, shouldn't the yellow mark student be back to the average difficulty level after getting question two correct? You're talking about this guy over here, Harshad. Great question. So remember this. Um, as uh, an adaptive test and, and thinks uh, like, like an actual uh, person would think. And, 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 and so if you've done, if you give an actual person two tests, test one is of a difficulty level 10, test two is of a difficulty level five, and the person does test one wrong and, and does well in test two, the next test that you would give is not 10, not five, but you'll give a seven. So that's what it, it, it is. Okay. So um, Harshit, hopefully that answers your question. Great question, Harshit. So 84% of you really say student one and you guys are correct. Now, can you tell me why is it student one? What's the reason despite identical accuracy? Uh, why is it that uh, uh, that student one is doing better? Because both of them have answered three out of five questions correctly. What does that mean ability? Just can you translate that word into, into something which is a bit more um, simple to digest? Yes, I like the fact that answered more difficult questions. Hard questions get more points. Now, think about it this way. When, I, when we break the problem down into something that's simple, you guys are able to, to add, uh, define causality over here. Um, for those of you who really say difficult questions have more weight and you got more difficult questions right, um, uh, uh, you know, that's something uh, 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 that you guys now understand or are beginning to understand how the GMAT works. For those of you who really say he got the initial questions correctly, you guys are still a bit more formulaic, which kind of is another question, uh, uh, which 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 I want to make sure that that you understand that a lot of people really say um, uh, 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 that that oh should I focus more on, on on initial questions? One of the fundamental assumptions when you make that statement is that if you focus more, you you get the initial questions. You have a higher likelihood of getting the initial questions right. Am I correct? One of the fundamental assumptions is if you focus more on the initial questions, you have a higher likelihood of doing that. But aren't you going into ACE the test? So should that likelihood be more or less flat? The point that I'm trying to make is think about it this way. You know, as humans, we have what we call as our own sweet time to do a certain task. And, and a, a question of a certain difficulty level is equivalent to, to, to a task. If you can't do that task in that own sweet time, you will likely not do that task even if I gave you 30 to 40 seconds more. How many of you have um, actually solved a question, answered it and then gotten to the correct answer and then you said, hey, let me go revise that thing once again, make sure I absolutely have the correct answer and, and in the process have in turn marked the incorrect answer. How many of you have done that? Start solving a question, Let's say an SC question, in, in a minute 10, you, you mark the correct answer and say, let me revise and do this. And, 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 and then you end up marking the wrong one. Yes, that's what happens when you give more time than the, the required time to, to a task. There's an equal probability that, um, that you're going to get it wrong. The thing that I want to make sure is, if you're aiming for a 700 plus score, which about 90% of you are, um, then the initial questions are going to be easy anyway. Okay. And, and, and so you just take, you just follow the appropriate process. Don't put stress on, hey, it's an initial question, it's a later question. Or don't worry about asking this question, how to identify how difficult the question is. Why? Because if an initial question is super difficult, then getting that wrong won't matter. If it's medium, you, shouldn't, you won't be getting that wrong if you prepared well. So, so it, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's like if you're playing cricket, getting a full toss and, and you know, if you're a good batsman, you probably hit it out for a six or, or if early on in a soccer match, you get an open goal, you get a lot of space, you're going to be able to hit that. So don't worry about identifying the difficulty level in the same way that, you know, uh, you won't worry about, hey, I have an open goal, should I be super careful? No, just hit the ball in. If it's a difficult chance. Do the first 10 questions matter more to score high? Uh, that's a loaded question. I'm going to hold on to that question. I don't want to give the wrong answer to you guys. So, okay. But one thing we really say is don't judge a question. Don't judge a question. But let's kind of go to the takeaways over here. So both these students 
got five questions. They got 60% accuracy, as you guys can see over here. Student one clearly has a higher score. Why? Because student one was served five questions. Each of these questions were at the average difficulty level or above the average difficulty level. Student two only got one question, which was at the average difficulty level, which was this question over here. Now, what does it mean that with regards to the takeaways that, that, that you should have? And when I say um, uh, one is that in order to ask the GMAT, you have two challenges. One is to get difficult questions served to you. So not everyone's going to get questions of, a, of identical difficulty level served to him or her. So your first challenge is to get these difficult questions served to you. The second challenge is to answer those difficult questions correctly. Okay. When you combine these two challenges, okay, you would get to this takeaway. Your, your GMAT scores governed by your ability to answer difficult questions correctly. Can you see that? How when you combine these two challenges, challenge one and challenge two, this is what you take away. This is the inference. Hey, your GMAT scores is governed by your ability to answer difficult questions correctly. Why? Because you answer difficult questions correctly or medium questions correctly, then you get difficult questions served to you. If you answer them correctly, then again, you get more. It's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, essentially. Can you guys see that? Can I get a yes or so? Just think about it this way. There's no timing here. There's, there's, there's no, hey, which question to choose over here. There's nothing of that over here. Very, very simple stuff. Okay. We all know this. Now, this was a simulation. We talked about that. Let's kind of talk about some real data. And this real data is of the older GMAT, which, by the way, was in the 2018 era, uh, when, you, when the verbal section of the GMAT had 41 questions. And what I have for you is two students, they, they kind of look very similar. So if you look at question numbers 11 to 41 over here and 11 to 41 over here, both these students have identical accuracy. They've answered 9 out of 31 questions correctly. The primary difference is that this guy got the first two questions wrong. Again, do not take the wrong inference from this. That first 10 questions are important, but he got the first two questions wrong over here. When you look at their scores, you know, they're, they're, they're drastically different. Student 1 got a 97th percentile. Student 2 got a 65th percentile. Now, assuming, or not assuming, more or less this is closer to fact, that about 200,000 students take the GMAT every year. So what that 97th percentile leads to is a six, rank of 6,000 on verbal. And what the 65th percentile leads to is a rank of 70,000 on, on GMAT verbal. Now, how many of you, when you look at this and say, hey, uh, man, two questions and, 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 and uh, 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 the delta of about, what, uh, 64,000 students in between them? So, so how many of you really say, hey, the GMAT is, 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 is really harsh? How many of you say this, the GMAT is, hey, very unforgiving or, or forgiving. I'm going to remove broadcast as well. So what do you think about your, your inference from this? Would GMAT is A, forgiving or B, unforgiving? Oh, I should have actually had a third piece over here. Rajiv just told me no idea. Um, but, but let's take forgiving or unforgiving. I want you to make a definitive um, uh, 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 statement over here. Is the GMAT forgiving? Is the GMAT unforgiving? based on just looking at this data over here and considering that it's a computer adaptive test. Forgiving or unforgiving? A bit more, put a stake in the ground, guys. You know, you're not losing anything even if you're wrong. You learn something. Uh, one of the other things which I want to tell you is, when you come, if you're in this webinar, it's a very low risk environment. And, and, and so if you're wrong, you're going to learn something. If you're right, you're going to go get a pat on the back and you'll really say, hey, this is something that I knew over here. So um, uh, don't be afraid to participate. In fact, that's how you add to this, this, this experience of this entire group over here. Okay. All right, let's broadcast this. And I'm going to end this poll because I don't want people shifting. So 21% of you say the GMAT is forgiving, uh, but 80% of you say the GMAT is unforgiving. Those 21% are a bit further along on, that, uh, 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 on their journey to that 700 or higher or that 730 or higher score. Let's say why I say the GMAT's really forgiving. And this is something which, you know, a lot of people really look at these first two questions and say, man, I got two questions wrong and, and, and the GMAT screwed me. No, that's not the thing. 
First of all, look at this. 9 out of 41 questions wrong, you still get to 97th percentile. Man, which test allows you to do that? 9 out of 41 questions wrong, still 97th percentile. How forgiving does the test have to be? Think about it that way. Okay. First of all, can you see that? 9 out of 41. Lots of mistakes, still 97th percentile. Really great score over there. Now, let's simulate this guy over here. One of the things that you have to really understand is how the GMAT works is very similar to how we as humans would work. Okay. So, let's kind of go back to this. Uh, yeah, don't go to CAT. The GMAT's not the CAT. It's a very different exams. Um, there is a huge catch up mechanism on the GMAT, by the way. And I'm going to show more data points over here. But let's look at student 2 in this case. Student 2 actually got the first question. Now, what's the first question? What is the difficulty level of the first question? What do you, it's about 50th percentile, right? So he got that question wrong over here. Now, he got the second question, which was a 30th percentile question, which means 70% of the people who, who, who answer that question answer it correctly. He got that question wrong as well. Are any GMAT whizzes or math whizzes or quant whizzes or probability whizzes over here? Tell me, what is the likelihood that a 90th percentile guy would get a 50th percentile question and a 30th percentile question wrong one after the other, assuming a standard normal distribution? I should say it slightly differently. Assuming a standard normal distribution of likelihood of getting something incorrect, what is the probability that a 90th percentile student will get a 50th percentile question wrong and a 30th percentile question wrong one after the other? What is that joint probability? Anyone who's an algorithm designer? Yes, it's less than 1 in 10,000. Less than 1 in 10,000. Again, you're not supposed to know this on the GMAT. You will not be tested uh, uh, about this on the GMAT. In fact, if you know this, you probably shouldn't be taking the GMAT. You'll probably make more money as an algorithm designer. So um, less than one in 10,000 is what I would say. In fact, it probably is even lower. I just did that math and then I didn't bother to do it more. So at this point in time, at question number three, the, the, the question picking algorithm, remember there's a question picking algorithm over there. That's not uh, wrong because we as humans would do the same thing and say, hey, this guy's probably not as smart right it's not a smart cookie so it gave so, so they're going to give him a very very easy question now why is why does the test serve you easy questions when when you get a difficult question wrong why does the test serve you easy questions okay to testability can you translate that no why i know that's how the gmat works have you ever wondered why to see what ability level you are at. The, the thing which you have to understand is, has anyone done hiring over here? Has anyone hired people? Right? Now, if you're talking about a multiple response test, not a, a, a qualitative test, but a quantitative test, the only way to evaluate where someone stands is to make sure they're, to get them to do things right. If someone makes a mistake, you, it's very difficult to pass judgment on what they know and what they don't know, right? If you're not, if you're in a qualitative discussion, yes, but not in a quantitative discussion or in an in a, in a, in a MCQ level test. The only way you can judge someone's ability is to really get them to answer something correctly. So when you make mistakes on medium and easy questions, the test will throw a super easy question at you because it wants to figure out what is it that you know, because so far two questions have gone by and the test has no idea where you currently stand. Okay, so the test gives you a super easy question over here. So that's what it did to student two. He got that right. Then he said, okay, let me increase the difficulty level slightly. He got that right. Kept on increasing the difficulty level over here, over here, over here. And by the time it got to a certain difficulty level, the guy started making mistakes again over here. Okay. Student one, on the other hand, got the first five questions correct. He was already hitting 700 level questions and he continued to answer them correctly at that point in time. Now both these students 
over here were EGMAT students, and 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 so this this was their this their um, GMAT prep score results. So there was a time when in, before the official GMAT mocks, GMAT prep was an application. We would get all of this data. Their actual score were very similar. This guy ended up getting a V44. Uh, this guy ended up getting a V35. So that GMAT prep was a really good estimate of what their ability is. Okay. So the bottom line that I want to really say is that some of you who were saying the GMAT doesn't allow you to go back. It actually does because at this point in time, at question number three, his ability was 20th percentile. He was able to get to 65th percentile because of it. And by the way, had he not made these mistakes, um, he probably would have had the ability, the opportunity to get to 90th percentile too. The problem at least he just didn't have the ability. If he didn't have the ability, he shouldn't be going to 90th percentile. Okay. Now, you guys looked at accuracies over here. The GMAT doesn't look at accuracies or, or it, it, it translates accuracies into something called abilities. So on the verbal side, for example, the guy who scored 97 percentile V43, internally the GMAT computed these ability scores. SC he was at 95th percentile, CR he was at 95th percentile, RC he was at 87th percentile. On the other hand, for the V32 guy, these were the ability scores that the GMAT computed. Now, when you look at both these students through a lens of ability, do they look very different? Right? They're very, very different when you look at them. Remove accuracy away. Again, when I say you should focus on building ability on the GMAT, this is where, uh, this is why the GMAT test. Purely, um, if you actually, have, has anyone seen an ESR over here? Has anyone seen an, an enhanced score report? Right? What's the first metric that you see on an enhanced score report? Your ability scores, right? After your quant and verbal scores, you get your ability scores. Why? Because your, those ability scores lead to that verbal score. That verbal score, which by the way is also an ability score, leads adds to about 50% of, 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 of your score out of 800. And the quant score, which also is an ability score, adds to the other 50%. Okay? Really, really important over here. Okay. So, again, you'll see me use this word ability again and again over here. So, what abilities does the GMAT measure? There are three ability scores that you get on, 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 um, on, on verbal, which is SCCR and RC. And there are two ability scores that you have on quant, which is arithmetic and algebra geometry. If you're an EG math student, we translate these two ability scores into five distinct ability scores as well so that you get more granularity. Essentially, in other words, what I'm trying to tell you is if I know these ability scores, I can really predict this score with 99.95 percentile certainty, percentage certainty. And if I know these two ability scores, I can predict this quant ability score again with a similar likelihood, which means I can predict your GMAT score within a range of 10 points over there. So what abilities does the GMAT measure? The GMAT measures, uh, okay, let me actually go to the this slide over here. Just give me one second. Just give me one second. Yeah, the photo I think was, was missing for some of you over here. Just give me, I am going to go over here and, so I think I'm gonna give you the PDF and you'll be able to see this, but essentially the takeaway from that slide was that there are um, uh, there are three abilities in, in quant, uh, in, in verbal and two in quant. Now, we went from the basic algorithm of the GMAT to, to GMAT prep, which is your official mocks today. Now we're going to talk about an actual GMAT case over here where this is an actual attempt. This is a student who, who, who got a V40 on, on verbal. This guy improved from a V17, which is kind of like 15th percentile on verbal, to a V40, which is 91st percentile on verbal. The first thing that I want you to see is for those of you who say we've never seen an enhanced score report, this is what an enhanced score report gives you. It tells you your ability scores in SC. Uh, RC and CR over here. So this guy got a 94th percentile in, in SC and 73rd in 
and 79th percentile in CR and RC. Okay, and and um, and and which lead, led to his overall score being 91st percentile. Um, you can click on this and and um, and you can download his ESR and I'll, I'll give you the link as well. Now, this is how his his verbal attempt went by. You can see this is question number one over here. This is question number ten. This is question number twentieth. 33rd and then this is 41st again this is an old ESR but what you see over here is the guy did most of the initial questions correct uh, when the questions were medium and medium hard as the difficulty level of questions increased from medium hard to hard he started making more mistakes which each one of you is likely to do so but in the last two blocks once this test was just serving primarily hard questions to him was serving primarily hard questions he kind of got half of them wrong but was still able to get to a 91st percentile so when it comes to the test being a forgiving test, as long as you don't make mistakes in easy and medium questions, the test is very, very forgiving. Okay. Does this mean if we solve fewer questions but correctly, we are bound to score more? Yes. That's, that's a good inference to really say. Or a better inference, I would say, is as long as you make mistakes just on difficult questions and you got, even if you get 55% of difficult questions correct and 45% wrong, you're still going to get a great score. That's kind of how, think about it this way, the diff, for a difficult question, you know, the likelihood of getting a difficult question right is about 45%. And, and if you answer 58% of difficult questions correctly, again, to that joint probability, you'll start to get into that high 80th percentiles. Okay. Again, your GMAT score is governed by your ability to answer difficult questions correctly. Okay. All right. So far, how are we doing? Are we getting a clear idea on on, on what does uh, how, what how do things work on the GMAT? Not that good. Why? Okay, if you're weak in that one section and you get that question wrong, does it affect the entire test? Test. That's a great question. Now, remember the five abilities that I talked about: three in verbal, SCCR and RC, and two in quant, arithmetic and algebra geometry. Each of these five abilities is independent. Okay, which means that let's say you 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 let's kind of go back to this over here so so let's say you you get an easy question wrong in sentence correction it will not have an impact on the difficulty level of question that you get served in in cr or rc it will have an impact on the difficulty level of questions you get in, get served in sc but not in cr and rc okay these subsections are are are, are, are completely independent or if you were to draw even a bigger inference I can share some score reports with you where someone has scored a zero percentile in RC but has scored a 90th percentile in SC and, and, and CR and still has gotten a V36 despite that zero percentile. Why? Because they almost just perfectly. Okay. Uh, not just one, I can show multiple score, official score reports that do that. Okay. Um, the second question, this guy's question in the Q&A pod, please, I, I, I look for the short answer part for your responses, right? Truly appreciate that. This means that if you get all medium questions correct and half of difficult questions wrong, it will not, affect. I won't say it will not affect, I'd say you'd still get a great score if you do that. If you get, and I'd say if you get all medium correct and half of difficult questions correct, you'd still get to that, that 75th to 80th percentile. You'd still get to a V37, V38. That's what I would say. So if you're an EGMAT student, what's the minimum passing score for, uh, for, for hard cementing quizzes? Anyone remember? 55, right? Yes, that's, no. For medium, it's 70. For hard cementing, it's 55%. That is why it is 55%. If you're an EG Math student, you know this. That's why hard cementing is 55, not 80, not 90. It gets you over that threshold. It tells me you know the process. It tells me that you only have specific weaknesses, which means you don't need to go to the course again to revise stuff. Maybe one application file, if at all, but not a whole lot. What is hard cementing? Hard cementing is a stage of learning that you have in the EG Math process. And again, we're going to talk about this later. Uh, but but in, in, in the EGMAT course, we kind of evaluate you in every subsection. We give you, we evaluate you on but a few hundred points in every subsection. And so when you, when you do things well, we know there are certain things that you know. When you make a mistake, we know precisely where you need, a, where you need help. If you go to our YouTube channel and you really say, hey, this guy 
well, EG Math student scored 700, then he worked with us. In 15 days, he went to 760. The reason we are able to do this is because we have all of this data. We know precisely what you need to work on. Okay, with that, let's talk about uh, uh, how can you know during the exam you're doing good? You don't know. Don't worry about it. Just, uh, 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 just focus on doing the test. Don't worry about it during the test because most, more often than not, you will screw yourself up if you, if you start worrying about it. Okay, let's talk about study plan. What is a study plan? Why don't you tell me? What's a study plan and, 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 and why do you need one? Okay. I want to see more questions. What is a study plan and why do you need one? Okay, I am getting some really good answers over here to keep you on track. To stay consistent. Which parts to focus for efficient time allocation. Organized approach, good. A systematic approach to target your weak areas. See, here's the beauty of having so many people in, in, in a session. You get a variety of responses. It's what I call as a wisdom of crowds. You put all of that together and you get a really good response over here. Rome wasn't built in a day, so you've got to build a plan. I should say Rome wasn't built without a plan. Think about it this way. Not just Rome wasn't built in a day, but Rome wasn't built without a plan, a construction plan. Okay, VG has a great question about the prior thing, which is, how can you measure how good I am compared to others? Um, when, when, you know, all you're doing is giving me a quiz. That's a great question, don't you think? Like, you're giving me a quiz and you're telling me I am in the top 10 percentile or I'm in the top 20 percentile. How the hell can you tell me that? Because you've not seen how the next guy is going to do, right? Yes, the question is, I'm giving you items uh, that are very well measured. I know this is an item which my population of test takers is going to score. Uh, half of them are going to get wrong. So if you your likelihood of getting those items correct is 70%, then I'm putting you in the, in the 90th percentile category very clearly. Okay, that's, that's basically it. Great question, VG. Does that help? One last question. Does the first question of all subsections start with medium difficulty level? So, uh, in most tests, yes. Remember, there's always a certain amount of randomness in all of this. I have seen about 10% of the tests where the first question is of a super high difficulty level. Again, that's what I'm saying. Don't worry about the first 10 questions. Worry about doing questions right. Don't worry about the difficulty level. Don't judge the question. Okay. So, in most tests, uh, uh, yes, the first few questions would be of medium difficulty, but there will be some tests where the first few questions will be hard. So don't bother judging, please. And I can tell you, I mean, there's probably not, any, uh, you won't find a single expert who's created more questions than I do. Probably Pyle, but but no more than, no one other than that. E regardless of whether you're looking at Ron Pureval or, or Stacy Coprins, um, at EG might we've created more questions. And I can tell you, I am wrong 30% of the time when judging the difficulty level of a question. Okay. So, let's talk about study plan. Uh, penalty of missing questions due to time constraint. Don't miss questions, just randomly mark them, please. If you want a, a, a precise response, if you're scoring V25, you miss a question, you're likely to score slightly higher. If you're scoring V30, you miss a question, you're likely to score a lot lower than getting all of them wrong. So think about this way. If you're at a V22 zone uh, uh, and, 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 and you miss questions, uh, you're going to probably get V24. That's just how um, you know the probabilistic algorithm works. If you're in a V30 and, and, and you can either mark all questions and probably get all of them wrong or not mark any questions, you're probably going to get a lower score um, based on my discussions and my, my study of research uh, that the GMAC has published versus if you just randomly mark them. So in my opinion, if you're in this session, you should be in the V35 zone when you take the test or higher and, and which means don't leave a question unattended, mark it randomly. 
Okay. So with that, let's talk about what does a study plan do? All right, I'm running about six minutes behind based on where I want to be, but you, you guys have such great questions. A study plan answers these three questions for you. One is, how will I reach my target GMAT score? So each one of you is different. Each one of you comes with your own set of strengths, your own set of weaknesses, your own set of constraints with regards to how much time can you put in, how consistently can you put in that time. Um, okay. Uh, so, so a study plan answers that question, that what is that journey for you uh, 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 for that target GMAT score? Okay. What is What are those high-level milestones that you need to achieve? All right. Um, you saw in that V40 attempt for, for that particular student, I think his name is Axel, um, that, um, that, that for him, he excelled in SC and for CR and RC, he had that 75th, 77th percentile or so. Uh, that was the right approach for him. For you, it may be that you excel in CR, maybe you aim for that 75th percentile in SC and, and that 80th percentile in RC. So, so how will you reach that target GMAT score? Right in the beginning, we can tell that based on if you if you know your starting abilities. We can tell what, what is your natural propensity. And, and, and that how is the probably one of the more important things over here. And I'm going to show with an example why that's really important. The second thing is how much time do you need? So if you have a certain starting point, if you want to improve your, your SC from that 50th percentile to that 80th percentile, do you need three weeks? Do you need three days? Um, uh, do you need three months? How much time do you actually need? And the last and probably the most important thing is, where do I need to put this time? Do I need to focus on learning content or can I just go to practicing questions? A lot of people, when they come over here, uh, they start studying for the GMAT, and especially those who come from the CAT background, focus on, on, on practicing questions. A lot of people focus on taking 10, 12 mocks. How many of you do that? You say, I'm going to take about 12 mocks. I'm going to take a mock every week to figure out how well I'm doing. Yes. Wasted approach. On the GMAT, wasted approach. And here is the response. Took 40 plus mocks for CAT. Here's something that I want to tell you with regards to the CAT test. And, and for those of you who don't know what, what, what CAT is, it's an Indian equivalent of the GMAT. So here is how the CAT works. The CAT is a flat test and it has easy, medium and difficult questions. So if you want to score high on the CAT, you need to be able to identify which questions are easy, answer them first, then identify which questions are medium, answer them next, and then whatever time you've left, go and answer the hard questions. Isn't that how we, we you, you guys prepare for, for, for CAT, right? Identify easy questions, answer them first, identify medium questions, answer them next, then if you have time, answer some hard questions. So essentially, the key to acing that Indian equivalent of, 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 of the GMAT is, is, is your ability to, to identify which questions are easy, which questions are medium. That's kind of the first thing, which is why I, I don't like CAT as a test. It's a pattern recognition test. Smart people who, who, who focus on solving interesting questions don't score high because they should focus on solving dumb questions first. Okay. Um, on the GMAT, do you choose which questions to answer? Do you choose? No. You don't. In fact, if you're going to get to V40, you probably will not get a single easy question. You probably will get 65% of questions that you'd get are, are hard questions. The other 35 would be composed of medium, hard and hard. Okay. So, so. So using that, that mock test mentality backfires on the GMAT. Why? Because the, your score is governed by the ability to answer difficult questions correctly. And taking a mock test helps you in pattern recognition. It doesn't help build ability. Okay. How do you gauge the level of the question? You don't. Leave that job to us. You just answer questions. I found that I was making mistakes in some SC questions, even if we did the SC course. Remember I said 55% accuracy in hard, which means you're going to get 45% of hard questions still wrong or 35% of hard questions still wrong. And you still be in 90th percentile. You'll still be able to get to a 760. Okay. I don't know a whole lot about the NMAT also. So um, I think I'm going to keep myself on track over here. So this is what a study plan does. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, 
Um, I'm going to actually compare two students who want to go from that score of 600 to 740. And these students are Abby and Chase. So both Abby and Chase are, are, are at 600 and both of them want to get to a 740. But they're very, very different students over here. Abby is, is, has a more balanced quant and verbal score. She's at a Q42 and a V31. Chase is really good in quant. He's at a Q49. Q49 is, is, is at a very close to a perfect quant score. It's two points away. And, and consequently, his verbal score is much lower. He's a lot more weaker in, uh, a lot more weak in verbal. So the first question, who do you associate with? Are you more like Abby? Are you more like Chase? Who do you associate with? Are you more like Abby? Are you more like Chase? Which means, are you more balanced with regards to quant and verbal? Or, or, or are you like, are you super strong in quant and then not as strong in verbal? Okay, 50-50 split. Okay, so half of you are Abbeys, half of you are Chasers, which is, which is really great. Let's move forward over here. So, now, just to make things simple, this could be very different. What I've done is, I've created their, their arithmetic and algebra geometry percentile. So, Abby takes a sigma x mark. By the way, for those of you who don't know your starting percentiles, the most insightful mock in the industry is the Sigma X mock because it's the only mock that gives you uh, uh, an estimate of, of your abilities over here. And, and you can take a Sigma X mock um, and, uh, by, by, by clicking on this and bookmarking this link over here. So you take a Sigma X mock and I've made things simple. I said, let's say um, uh, Abby is at 42nd percentile in arithmetic and 42nd percentile in geometry in algebra geometry. It could be that Abby could have been at 68th percentile in, uh, in, 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 in an arithmetic and at 30th percentile in algebra geo. But just to keep things simple, um, her percentile in, 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 in arithmetic and algebra geometry is around that 42nd percentile and her percentile in verbal is around that 60th percentile over here. Similarly, Chase is around that 70th percent, 72nd percentile in, in the two subsections in quant and around that 35th percentile in the two subsections in, in the three subsections in verbal over here. Okay. Um, now, let's kind of talk about this. Do you think, let me just hide this, that Abby and Chase will need to get to the same quant scores to get to that score of 740? Do you think they'll need to put in the same time in quant and verbal to get to that 740? Or study the same content? The answer to each one of these questions is no, they won't. Okay. Okay. They shouldn't. All right. So how do you figure out uh, uh, essentially what score should you get? So we've delivered this, we've created this utility called the personalized study plan that takes into that uh, account your current abilities. And so once you take a sigma x mark, you get your starting abilities, then uh, you, you can uh, launch your PSP and it tells you what should be your target abilities. It looks at uh, about a thousand plus score reports that we have and, and, and gets the most optimal plan. Okay. So how does it work? So with Abby, for example, you can see at a Q42 over here with his, with her abilities in this case. So with the platform suggests that she should aim for a V42 and, and a Q48. V40, Q48 means 65th percentile abilities. And again, these abilities are also computed. So if Abby were weaker in, in algebra, this probably would have been a 50th percentile ability and this probably would have been an 80th percentile ability, which some of you could be and some of you actually are over there. And similarly, on, 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 on the verbal side, it computes the target abilities that, that she should aim for. Okay. Then it calculates the amount of time that Abby needs in various subsections. I'm going to make it bigger so you guys can read this. It should now encompass the entire screen. So Abby would need about two weeks, two weeks of dedicated effort in SC, two weeks of dedicated effort in CR, two weeks of dedicated effort in RC, um, and just about a week, a week and a half in, um, in, 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 in essentially arithmetic and algebra geometry to, to get to that target score, to go from these ability scores here to this ability score here. And okay. So that's Abby's study plan over here. For Chase, now we are on with Chase over here. Chase again has a very, very different starting set of abilities. So for Chase, the platform says, hey Chase, 
aim for a q50 v40 v41 again tra this translates into different abilities over here now chase is pretty much there because he's aiming for a q50 over here so it's pretty much there he just needs about a week of effort in quant which is just to revise stuff but then he needs about three weeks effort each in sccr and rc to reach an ability score that is lower than the ability score that abby is is aiming for okay so let's kind of look at chase versus abby over here all right so chase is his score is q40 a q50 v40 abby is aiming for uh, a v42 and a q48 now many of you would say hey the you know v48 uh, uh sorry q48 versus q50 doesn't seem very different but it is a very different score a q50 student is a very different student from a from a q48 student a q50 student in terms of his or her abilities has a much higher ability similarly someone who gets to a v40 is, is different from someone who gets to a v42 but that's not the biggest difference the biggest difference is look how much time he needs chase needs 50 percent more time than abby does to get to a, a, a verbal score which is lower than abby's verbal score similarly abby needs twice as much time to get to a quant score which is lower than chase's quant score why is getting these estimates important why is that important why is it important to get precise estimates and have the right expectations over here what happens if you really say hey i'm going to do sc in two weeks when you really need three three and a half weeks what happens over there if you need three three and a half weeks and you say i'm going to take two weeks yes you you start if you if you give yourself two weeks when you really need three and a half weeks you have start to have unrealistic expectations if you have unrealistic expectations you you kind of recognize by the end of first week i'm not getting to where i want to and we you rush through doesn't that happen if you say i've got to i, I plan to finish this in two weeks and it's one week and i'm, I'm about 30 percent done you rush through you skim what happens when you skim you don't get to that 90th percentile That's a great question. Does it also specify how much time per day? It doesn't specify. It asks you to tell it how much time per day, and then it computes this time. Okay. So if you tell it, if you tell yourself eight hours per day, the system will not require three weeks. But if you tell the system it's two hours per day during the weekdays, uh, four hours per day during the weekend, the system will will accordingly adjust that. Okay. Um, again, the key thing which is there is. Even though they started at the same starting score, both of them were at 600, both of them wanted to get to the 740, their path to that target score, the amount of time required to that target score, they were very, very different. And they are very different if you want to get there. But that's not the biggest difference. We still are scratching the surface. Okay, The biggest difference is where they spend their time. And, 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 and that's really important. And to do that, what I want to talk about is, is what we call as the stages of learning. And, and there was this question, what if you're starting new? This slide is for you. What if you're at 88% already? This slide is also for you. And if you understand this slide, you would know uh, 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 when to practice and when not to practice. Okay. So here is what we call as how your ability improves as you learn certain skills. When you learn concepts, you know certain application. So, so with regards to that ability score, knowing concepts is about 25th percentile. Learning, knowing application is about adds another 25 percentiles points to it. Mastering that application gets adds another 20 percentile points. And when you refine to perfection, so even when you're learning concepts, you know you're not perfect. There are certain concepts that you're naturally good at. There are certain concepts that that you're not good at. So when you go to a YouTube channel, you see certain debriefs. You'd also see some 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 course accesses videos where we talk about how much time someone spent on each application file and each concept file. And what you're going to really see is that that time's different from for for everybody. And the question is, why is it different for everybody if they're accessing the same piece of content? The reason is, each one of you has your own strengths and your own weaknesses. Some people, as I said, need to go through certain pieces of content twice. Uh, some need to actually just not go through that piece of content 
and 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 which is where that refinement to perfection comes in um, in this case okay but these are the stages of learning and this is what you need to really do so let's kind of understand what does this translate to so if you understand this chart properly let's talk about verbal abby is 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 primarily uh, uh, around that 60th percentile in the beginning where would she be spending those two weeks in sc where do you think which stage of learning where would her in sc in sentence correction which stage can you type it out the, you have four parts over here learn concepts and application master application refine to perfection and maintain performance yes you guys are right abby is primarily going to spend her time in mastering application and refining to perfection why because the fact that she's at 60th percentile means that 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 that, that she knows the concepts otherwise she won't be at 60th percentile so if abby were to start an egmat course and if i'm if i can really certify that she's at 60th percentile i wouldn't ask her to go through concepts no i won't i would really say hey abby focus on just the application files then do cementing and then do test readiness does that make sense if you're starting at a 60th percentile it means you know those concepts right but you don't study like this you read a book from the first page even when you get to a classroom course that's how you go everyone goes through the same set of lessons no you're not supposed to do that because each one of you has different strengths on the quant side it's just the other way around abby needs to learn the concepts she is at that 42nd percentile she still needs to learn concepts for those of you who've gone through our new quant course that quant course so it's a brand new learning architecture that 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 we 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 launched and we're launching this with quant um uh, in every quant course whether it's number properties whether it's algebra whether it's word problems we have about a thousand learning paths just in number properties with the number properties we tell you hey in even or do you know the concepts do you know the process skills do you know the application and and the diagnostics tell you and accordingly you navigate from there this was a course that we launched um, just in december and and we can we getting some amazing reviews over there okay um for those of you who are eg math students you probably have gone through number properties and, and geometry and um, middle of next week you'll very soon be going through algebra so uh, if you're an eg math student don't start algebra yet do you have learning concepts of verbal too yes you bet we have think one thing that i'll tell you is eg math is probably 3x as exhaustive as the best book you can see over there okay now let's come to chase chase is is a completely different story right uh, he's starting at the 35th percentile so he is 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 going to focus on learning concepts and application and mastering application now can you appreciate why does chase need 3 weeks in in sc versus 2 weeks just for abby can you appreciate that because of this part over here so there is the the outcome and there is the cause here on the other hand chase is already at that 72nd percentile all he needs to do is refine to perfection um gillian says that stays to mean only application file practice files and cementing uh, yes uh, gillian gillian or gillian i don't know uh, how to pronounce your name but uh, i'm assuming it's gillian so um stage to means go through the application files and just the practice files next to the application files not the practice files next to the concept files okay okay if you have official guide do we prefer that you should buy eg mat it's the question that you are asking is if 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 you have what is strategy by michael port or should you do an mba that's kind of the equivalent an official guide is not a learning guide it's just a practice guide okay now the key thing which is there is that even though both chase and abby they're aiming for that same score their path to that 740 score the time required to reach the score and what components of learning do they need to go through they are very very different i mean these are two people identical starting scores identical ending scores and you can really see how different is their study plan okay 
How many of you have seen this level of personalization? This is just at the beginning, by the way. How many of you have seen that? How many of you have seen this level of personalization? Okay. Yeah, not until EG Matt. I mean, I am actually. Uh, uh, don't compare us to Magush. So, so, so just to to Delhi, just say. I mean, that's a, a way older course. Um, okay. If you're an EGMAT student, make sure you have this PSP. Make sure you understand your personalized study plan. Make sure you go through the stages of learning. There's a purpose. Make sure you attend the onboarding sessions that work that are conducted for you and attend the test readiness session. Okay. That's really, really important. And make sure you have that guidance for, for stage one, stage two, stage three, all how do you build test readiness quizzes and scholarinium and all of those things. Okay. If you're a free trial to student, that's the first thing you should say. Take a Sigma X mock over there. Okay. And 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 Gillian, Gillian, yes, stage three is, uh, is, is test readiness quizzes and scholarinium and Sigma X mock over here. And and, and and then work with the GMAT strategy experts. So for those of you who, who want to build those study plans over here, uh, you guys can can um, can schedule a call with a with a GMAT strategy expert over here. So so Have you ever heard a student who religiously followed the PSP but didn't have an aptitude for this test? Yes. Oh, many. Yes. Here is something that I will tell you. Okay. And this is, uh, 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 I've been in this industry for 10 years. We've delivered more success than anyone else. So, so and more reviews. And if you look at the frequency with, with EG Matters delivered reviews, you'd really see that. Go to GMAT Club review page. There are a few things that you would observe. One is, no one has a thousand reviews. We have upwards of two thousand reviews. The second thing, consistency of reviews. The third thing, it's just EG Mad and Magoosh that have good and bad reviews. Every other prep company has just glowing reviews. Frankly, if you want to really uh, look at a litmus test for reviews, those are things that you should look at. And and I will tell you this: not everyone who joins EG Mat is is successful. Not because uh, 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 it's it's us. It's because you know just going through a prep course doesn't make you successful. You have to put in the rigor yourself. You have to be able to really say, I am going to study consistently even on those hard days. I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to really put in that effort. I'm going to not do certain things. Okay. Uh, if you don't do that, just the course will not make you successful. Just as just going to Harvard Business School will not make you a CEO. You know, not everyone who goes to HBS becomes a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. But if you look at the stats and if you want to become an MBA, a good business leader, you should look at proper stats. You will see two things. One is much more consistent success. And if you look at our YouTube channel, you will see the passion that our students have. Then how should you decide if you have the aptitude for it? Uh, I'll frankly tell you this. If you want to become a business leader, you've got to take the GMAT. Okay. Uh, if you're worried about a test such as the GMAT, tell me how the hell will you make a $10 million investment decision four years from now? It's This is just a test, man. Just a simple test that you can take uh, uh, seven, up to seven times, which probably you shouldn't, but you can take up to seven times and cost 250 bucks. That $10 million investment that you're going to vouch for requires a lot bigger heart. Does that make sense? Right? I mean, this, it's, this is just a test, guys. It's not the end of, I'll tell you, it's not the end of uh, a life for you, but it's a way to a great life. What, is there a limitation of EGMAT online course? I don't think there are uh, any limitations. Uh, seven is the maximum number of attempts allowed, yes.
Okay, you guys have questions about the EGMAT course. I love that, but I want to get through the webinar, guys, because I know you guys will buy uh, the courses. Those of you have questions, you'll find enough information online and 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 book book a slot with 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 with, with an expert. But one thing that I will tell you is, um, when you look at when you buy a course, look at the success rate and look at proper success rate, which is where um, you know uh, when you look at reviews, don't look at a Facebook reviews don't look at Google reviews why because those reviews can be given by by anyone um, in fact the other day I was looking at some of our reviews on MBA inside and I don't know who gave those reviews because some of them said we offer a great GRE course we never offered a GRE course uh, in in the 10 years of our existence um, so so GMAT club be the GMAT certify that every review is put in by someone who's purchased the course so um, and, and so that's where I would look at not at at, at trusted reviews or, or all of those. Those guys don't focus on 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 certifying anything. Should you go through the concepts before you take a Sigmax mock test? No, it's just you know I would say uh, do thirty questions, twenty thirty questions in each subsection. Sigmax the first Sigmax mock is supposed to be a baseline, not a prepared mock. Okay, so. How do you build ability? Let's kind of talk about this in, in, in this part over here. So, um, what have we learned so far? The first thing is you need to get to that 730 plus score to get into top B schools. The second thing is you've got to build ability. The third piece is you need that personalized study plan and there are these stages of learning. Okay. So, and there's this one stage of maintenance over here. So, with that, let's kind of talk about how do you build ability over here and, and, and why do you get stuck? The beauty of having so many people over here is you always have someone who answers yes to a question. How many of you are stuck at the 60th percentile in any subsection, whether it's arithmetic or, or whether it's algebra, whether it's word problems, whether it's sentence correction, whether it's reading comprehension? Okay. Now, what I'm going to tell you is what does it mean to be stuck at 60th percentile? And, and I'm going to focus primarily on 60th percentile. Why? Because a lot of people really, frankly, you, you study using books, you'll get to the, 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 the 50th, 60th percentile if you're diligent, but that's where you're going to get stuck. Okay. If you, but you're going to spend a ton of time, you're going to get to that 60th percentile. That's there. I've seen enough of that. If you're diligent, you're going to get there, but you're going to get stuck beyond that. And, and let me tell you why. Why is it that people don't improve beyond that 60th percentile? And I'm going to compare two students. One is a 60th percentile student. One is a 90th percentile student. How many people are at the 60th percentile? Uh, which means 60th percentile, if you assume 200,000 people take the test, it's about 80,000 folks over here. In SC, we're just focusing in SC. Uh, you know, people who get to that 60th percentile spend about 40 to 50 hours learning. Most of you, if you're a non-native, you're going to start around that between the 30th and 50th percentile. Most of you. There are some very smart non-natives. There are some people who need a lot more help. So some, a few of you would start at 18th. Other, others would start at 80th. But most of you, the majority is going to be around the 30th percentile. The piece which I want to really tell you is when it comes to the GMAT, everyone has capability. It's not the CAT. It's not a quant test. It's not an English test. It's a test of logic, which is where... Everyone has enough gray matter to, to excel in this. And I've seen enough of these, enough students over there. The 90th percentile guy is also very similar. He's among the top 20,000 students. Again, same amount of time, it's very similar starting ability. Capability is also very similar. Again, note, I'm not talking about those people who start at that 80th percentile or that 70th percentile. I'm talking about people who start at, at, at uh, from that 30th percentile, okay? The thing that you've got to understand is, when it comes to that 90th percentile, it's about achieving perfection. And perfection requires, in general, a slightly different approach to learning than, than just doing stuff. For those of you who are involved in, in projects, whether you're in a, in, a, in a chemical plant, whether you're coding software, I want you to, to really compare the, the most well-executed project that you've done and, and compare it to a project that this kind of average execution or maybe poor execution. And that's the delta between 90th and 60th. So have that in context and then listen to what I'm going to say. Okay. 
Here is what a 68th percentile student does. A 68th percentile student says, hey, GMAT sentence correction is about mastering these things, subject verbs, pronouns, modifiers, verbs, parallelism, comparison, and then they consider meaning as, as an error type. These people go through the concepts very quickly. They use meaning as, as a secondary technique. They use splits as a primary technique. Okay. When they're learning concepts, they, they get about seven to 10 feedback points while learning. And, 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 and with regards to those 40, 50 hours that they spend, about 30, 35% of those hours are spent learning content. 70% of the, that time is spent purely practicing questions. 60% students, does this resonate with you with regards to how you go about doing things? Forget about feedback points for now. But other than that, does this resonate with you? That's how you do 70% practice, 30% learning and, and, and uh, using splits. Okay. Forget about feedback points. I'm going to talk about it in about 15 minutes. Practicing for time management. I mean, you're at 68th percentile. You're already thinking about time management. Why? A 90th percentile student thinks about it very differently. For him, this is about a matrix of 200 different sentence structures. Each sentence structure can produce an error type. And, and those sentence structures, those primary error categories are the same, but it's, it's, it's a game of sentence structures and error ca categories in a matrix. This guy uses meaning as the primary method. Meaning for him is not an error type. Meaning is a way to solve questions. Okay. This guy gets feedback towards during his learning stages and his assessment stages and, and, and 10 times as much feedback. So when he gets to practice in questions, he is, he is more or less certain that his methods are correct. He has all the concepts right. Okay. Look at this time over here. 60% of his or her time is spent between learning. 40% of that time is, is spent between practice. Remember I asked, um, I, I, I asked this question, um, imagine the, the, the most well-executed product project and, and, and an average executed project. Really well-executed projects spend about 40 to 50% of their time defining the specification. Uh, if you're building software, building the UI, if you're building a plant, they, they uh, look at creating the schematics right then and there and making sure everyone is there. That takes about half the time, right? For those of you who've done, who've written software or who've designed plants, plants, I'm sorry, uh, when I say plants, it's a manufacturing plant. Specifying, designing, bringing everyone onto the same page takes about half the time. The more precise you are, the less time it takes to execute. That's kind of the same thing in on the GMAT. Okay. So, 200 error types, you're going to see what of this. And then again, we're going to demonstrate that. So I understand you guys have questions about feedback points in this. Hold, hold your horses for about 10 minutes. Okay. The thing that you have to really say is, how can you achieve perfection if these are the number of concepts and you get this much feedback over here? Okay. What feedback? When you, when you go through a subject verb, video lesson what feedback do you get to really say hey you know you can now define in which sentences should subject verb exist and which sentences uh, or how do you identify when a verb is missing okay um, how do you identify where does subject verb make sense where the subject and verb are illogical okay um, so what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about this over here but what, to do this, I want you to focus on solving this one question. So let's kind of do, um, answer your questions about, hey, what are these 200 error types? What is the feedback over here through, through an actual example? Okay, I'm going to give you this question and let's just see. I'm going to give you this question over here. And, and, and what I want you to do is I want you to look at and, and, and tell answer still solving. So that I can really know. Um, so I want about 50 people to say still solving. So when you choose another option other than still solving, I know that you guys are done solving and that's when I'm going to call time. Nickel says if somebody has, wants to study abroad, does he, have to give, does he or she have to give IELTS and, and TOEFL? Yes, um, TOEFL is, and IELTS are not as useful, but 
universities require. So, so that's there. If you ace the GMAT, you're going to pretty much do really well. Again, 50 people still solving, guys, before I show the question. I have 38 people saying still solving. Can I get another 12 people say to stay still solving? 45, 47, 49, and I have a, one person who's chosen choice A for some reason, but that's good. I'm going to remove broadcast results. Here is the question. Take a few minutes, take a couple of minutes and tell me which question, which, which choice is the correct. But 70% of you are done. Let's get those answers in, guys. Five. Is this an easy question? No, this is a difficult question, Molo. Four. Three. Two. And one. Let's end the poll and broadcast the results. This is how you guys have done. You can see which choice you chose, but 20% of you chose choice E, 21% cho uh, choice D, choice C, the most popular one is about 45% and practically no one chose choices A or B. So let's kind of look at how we go about solving this question. Um, before this, how many of you are certain of your response? How many of you are certain of your response? Let's kind of look at just this over here. This is a very important trait if, if you want to get to that 90th percentile. Why? Because on the test, if you're very certain of why you got a question right, you won't worry about the prior question. You would have your full attention to the next one. How many of you are very certain of your response? Okay, about 60% of you are very certain of your response. That's good. So let's move forward. So when you think about splits, Excuse me. Completely underlined question. There are not a lot of splits that exist in this question. You probably can't solve the questions using splits. And when you look at this, you really say, hey, beginning with the church coin, while with an ulterior motive to Christianize, and you have the church coin, the church coin twice, while twice, and then you have a sentence starting with that. And then you have but in four choices and not so much in, 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 in choice C over here. So it's like, okay. There are some way, but not so sure as to how would I use go, go about using splits. Why? Because there's no definitive right or wrong when you just look at these 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 starting points over here. 
So let's kind of look at that meaning-based approach. This is an approach that we invented, Pyle from EGMAT invented this in 2010, which was when people said meaning in SE doesn't exist. Um, and, 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 and to get that, so we are in that third generation of our, of our meaning-based approach right now. So we've refined this approach twice. So um, <coughs> let's kind of go about this. To, in this meaning-based approach, one of the first things you've got to do is you've got to strategically pause while reading a sentence so that you understand the complete meaning. Okay? The church coined the date February 14th as Valentine's Day. So the first piece over here is, okay, the church did something. What? They, they coined February 14th as Valentine's Day with an ulterior motive. What is that ulterior motive? To Christianize the pagan celebration of Lupercilia. That, so, so, so this part is claimed by a few experts. Okay, then the author says, but it is celebrated on this date to honor the anniversary of Valentine's death or burial is the more prevalent belief. So when you think about this and you look at this over here, you can see how this is what we call as a sentence structure approach. Um, this and this make is claimed by the church coin the it is claimed by a few experts makes a complete sentence and 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 this and modifies uh, sorry this modifies this part over here the first thing you've got to do is you've got to extract the meaning out of it and the first thing when you look at the meaning is there are two claims about the celebration of february 14th as valentine's day that are listed in this sentence claim one is that the church designated it with a specific motive claim two is it's done to honor the, the 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 anniversary of valentine's death or burial and the third aspect of meaning that you should extract from choice a is claim one is by a few experts claim two seems to be the more prevalent belief over here okay the thing to note over here is none of these claims is by the author one is by a few experts the second is the prevailing belief can you see part over here none of these claims is by the expert him, by the author himself claim one is by a few experts claim two is the more prevalent belief okay and this is something which is very important that you need to keep in mind not just in sc but also in cr and rc and rc if you don't understand this you will get killed okay now one two and three aspects of meaning i want you to mark when you were solving these questions tell me all the aspects that you could not identify and this is a multiple response question tell me all the aspects that you were not able to identify while solving this question yourself come on how many aspects could you not identify be, be truthful. All right. Three, two, and one. I have about, just about 20 people who've said that, or 22 people who've said that they can't identify. Actually, 35 people now. All right. So, we've already done that. If you understood all aspects, you're primed to answer this question correctly. You understand the meaning enough. If you could not understand one or more aspect, even before you look at the narrative types, figure out how to, to build that skill set to identify the meaning of, of your sentence. Because if you want to hit that 90th percentile, you need to learn this. You need to learn how to extract aspects of meaning. And the way you do that is, is using the strategic pausing technique. If you're an EG Math student, you've gone through some of this in Master Comprehension course. That course is designed to help you do strategic pausing and understand aspects of the sentence. Okay, so then let's kind of, we're still on choice A. We want to go very slow right now because you're still in that learning phase. What you see is there is no subject for his claim. The, the church coined, this is a subject word player, but there is no subject for his claimed. There is no subject for this word is. So we have two subjects missing. Why? Because this is a subject word pair, this is a subject word pair, but, but for, for the pieces in red, there is no subject. So clearly you have a subject verb error over here. Now we've taken this 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 meaning analysis and error analysis. We know choice A is not correct. Let's go to choice B over here. Now, just to understand this is choice B, you can read this. Here is the original answer choice. Okay. And and you have the three aspects of meaning over here. This is gonna be the format for every answer choice. Now, this is choice B over here. 
choice B says, while with an ulterior motive to Christianize the pagan celebration of Lupercilia, a few experts do claim. In choice B, who has the ulterior motive? Let's let me just put in my poll question. In choice B, who has the ulterior motive here? Who has the ulterior motive in choice B? A few experts. Is that what the author wanted to communicate? While with an ulterior motive to Christianize the pagan celebration of Lupercilia, a few experts do claim. Is that what the what, what we wanted? No. That the church coined this is this, but the blah blah blah. So, so we don't. What's wrong with choice B? Again, we are still in choice B over here. The first thing is it changes the meaning. It illogically suggests that the few that these experts present their claim about uh, behind this the day of uh, 14 February being celebrated as a Valentine's Day. It actually completely misses the reason why why the church coined that. So while attributing um, that the few experts had that ulterior motive, it kills the motive that the church had. Okay, because of this, choice B is wrong. Now let's get to choice C. I'm going to bring back choice C once again. Choice C was the most popular choice. Here is how you guys polled over here. Okay. Choice C says, while a few experts claim that the church coined February 14 as Valentine's Day with an ulterior motive to Christianize the pagan celebration of Lupercilia, their more prevalent belief in the original sentence whose belief is this? Is that for the same set of experts in the original sentence? No, it's not. Is there anything grammatically wrong with this? Nothing is grammatically wrong with this. But it communicates a completely different meaning. Okay. So, it illogically suggests that the same set of experts shared this belief over here. Can you now see the distortion in meaning over here? How many of you analyzed answer questions like this? Sentence correction questions that is. How many of you do this kind of analysis? Sometimes. Try to, yes. But isn't this simple? There's no grammar here. Isn't this super simple? This is called change in meaning, not ambiguous. The meaning by itself is logical here. Okay, there's a set of questions where the, the, that are grammatically correct where the meaning is illogical. Um, and I'm going to post one such question on our YouTube channel today. But here the meaning is logical, it's just change in meaning. Okay, is every question meaning based? Yes. What, what what is grammar? Tell me. What is grammar? What is grammar? No, no. What is grammar? What's the purpose of grammar? What's the purpose of rules? Why do we have rules? Ambiguity in what? Yes. Grammar is a tool to help you communicate effectively. Okay? It's a tool for you. Language is a means of communication, right? Why do we as humans develop language? To communicate with others, to organize society. Why did we develop grammar? So that what we communicate makes sense to the other person in the same sense that we intended it to be. So yes, there are rules. But MBAs are not supposed to be grammarians. Satya Nadella, Sundar Pachai, Shantanu Narayan. These guys are not grammarians. They're not better than the grammar teacher, than your grammar teacher. But they are way more precise than your grammar teacher. Their sentence structures are not fluent. May not be fluent. Most of, time, most of the times they are. But there will be times when they would speak and articulate words, which, which, which may seem like, hey, this is, a, this is not the best sentence structure. But they would be precise. So in the same way, GMAT SC is not a test of grammar. Anyone who tells you that doesn't know what SC is. Okay. 
Let's look at choice D. Choice D says, the church coined the date February 14th as Valentine Day with an ulterior motive to Krishna as a pagan celebration of Lupercilia, as claimed by a few experts. Okay, But its celebration on this day is to honor the anniversary of death burial, uh, of, of Valentine's death or burial, the more prevalent belief. Here is the problem in this. Here is the problem in this. In this sentence, who's making both the claims? In addition to these people who are making the claim, in this sentence, the expert, the author himself is backing the claims. In addition to these experts and the prevalent belief, the author is also backing the claim. And let me show you an example over here. Let's look at this. Apple is the market leader is claimed by Forbes magazine. Now, in this sentence, when you make this, are you communicating information? Yes, you are communicating information. Are you the one making the claim here? No, you are not the one making a claim here. You're merely saying, hey, Apple is the, is the market leader. Is that, that aspect, this entire aspect is claimed by Forbes magazine. You're telling someone that. And, and and by the way, if you don't take this into account in RC, RC will kill you. The this, this delta. It's, it's, it's the most tested concept in RC. What is the author communicating versus what is the author claiming? This is merely communicating information. The author is not making a claim here. Which means, if it turns out that Apple is not the market leader, you are not to blame. Okay? You are not to blame. You're just passing on information. Let's kind of look at this. So, so again, the summary of this. Apple is the market leader as claimed by Forbes magazine. I've used changed is to as. Are you communicating information? Yes. Are you making a claim here? Yes. In addition to, to Forbes, you are also making a claim here. Should you be blamed if it turns out that Apple is not the market leader? Absolutely. Huge difference here. If you write this sentence in a, in a report and it turns out you're wrong, you could be blamed. Your bonus could go away. And depending on how severe this is, you could be fired. And that's why meaning is important. I don't understand how you're making a claim here. Let's say you should, you should say you should, if you're from India, say, you should buy Reliance as everyone is, or since everyone is. Aren't you really putting your weight behind it? You should buy Reliance, the stock, since everyone is? You are. You should buy, you tell your dad you should buy Reliance since everyone is. You are putting your weight there. On the other hand, if you say you should buy Reliance is what everyone is saying, you're not making a claim here. You're just passing information. Okay. really important over here. Just to summarize this, Apple is the market leader is claimed by Forbes magazine. You're merely communicating information. But if you really say as over here, you are making a claim. Now, Forbes is also making a claim, but you are also backing that claim. Okay, with that, Let's look at choice D. The church coined the date February 14 as Valentine's Day with an ulterior motive to Christianize as claimed by a few experts. The author is now backing this claim. But its celebration on this date is to uh, honor Valentine's death or burial, the most prevalent, the more prevalent belief. The author is also backing that claim. Both these claims are now being backed by the author. Okay. There's another error as well. What is claimed by a few experts? Is it is it is it the the fact that the church coined the date or the ulterior motive? Which part is is, is modified by 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 as claimed? That part is also you know ambiguous. How is the second claim backed by the author? Okay. Um, 
let me just make us take a simple sentence uh, let's see if I can make a new note over here who, who who's making this uh, Uh, who's making this this COVID vaccine? AstraZeneca. What is it? Uh, Pfizer. Pfizer's okay. Okay. Uh, I want to make sure I type my my keyboard doesn't. When you say Pfizer's vaccine is effective, which everyone believes, uh, then you're also really just saying it is effective. You're, you're saying that, and then you're also saying it's, a, it's a, you're saying the second piece as well. That everyone believes that you're communicating both pieces over here. Okay, which gets me to the correct answer choice, which is choice E. Okay, choice E is the correct answer choice, which says that the church coined February 14 is claimed by a few experts okay that the church coined the day blah, blah blah with an ulterior motive is claimed by a few experts but the more prevalent belief is look at where the more prevalent belief is coming in it's the doer of the sentence the more prevalent belief is it is celebrated on this day to honor the anniversary none of the claims are by the author okay um, none of the claims is by the author the subjects are added here that is added as a subject here the more prevalent belief is as uh, the more prevalent belief is there How do I know the parts where the author does the claims is wrong? Because in the original sentence, the author did not do the claims. That's why. Okay. So attend the SC session. You will see many such sentences. Now, here is why people kind of reject this answer choice. They say, hey, how the hell does a sentence begin with that? This is a 700 level question. How many of you really said, hey, the sentence begin with that, I'm going to reject it. It doesn't sound right to me. How many of you did that? Why? Why? Who told you that? How many of you believe being is pretty much wrong in official questions? How many of you believe being is, is wrong? Where did you hear that? Being that being is wrong? Sorry, no, Manhattan Guide won't say that. Most likely not. I hope it doesn't. I, I read that guide 10 years ago. How many of you know of official questions where being is correct? Being. So here is my problem. I'm going to really share this thing over here um, I'm gonna share an article in response to uh, this comment by Jefferson it says my networks bad this is an article we wrote in 2013 okay which says being the black sheep all right in that article this is 2013 guys there was many examples in which in official sentences being was a part of the correct answer choice what these guides might say what and again this is where manhattan most likely will not have said that he they probably will say in, there are many instances in which being is wrong but they won't say point blank that being is wrong now some other experts might say but manhattan might, hopefully they haven't said that but the problem is when you're doing sentence correction and you look at stats i mean you know you're not doing stats here you're doing sentence correction here you have to focus on meaning and logic. In the same way, a lot of you also really say, hey, extreme answer choices are wrong on CR. How many of you have, have heard of that? If an answer choice says all or none in CR, reject it. Statistically, yes. I can, but I can show you official responses, official questions, where there are answer choices with, with most, with all, with none, with no one that are cor uh, those are correct who when did youtube start to become a, a gmat expert i mean when you say on youtube who the hell is there on youtube saying that 
Now imagine this, you go in a test, you go with this preconceived notion in the first five questions. Yes, the word being almost always indicates and it's, you should avoid it on the GMAT if possible. Yes, you shouldn't do that. Frankly, don't play a stats game. Read the article, that's official question evidence. And frankly, I will take this up with Stacy to say, why would you say that? Because it's, you know, you're not playing stats in SC. Imagine this, right? First eight questions. You get an answer choice. You don't even analyze it. You just say it has being, it can't be the correct answer. What the hell is going to happen to your attempt? Tell me. What is going to happen to that attempt? Or you get a CR question and you get an extreme answer choice and you don't even analyze it. Because that's your, your psyche, right? You see being, you don't, you stop analyzing stuff. So if this can't be correct, let me not. Isn't that your psyche? Yeah, it, it. Do not do that. You are not playing stats, guys. You want to play stats? Go to quant, not on verbal. Okay. Do not. Every choice needs to be analyzed. Don't reject it because statistically it could be, uh, there's, a, there's a low likelihood. How many people answer difficult? Uh, uh, what is your statistical likelihood to, to score 700? What is your statistical likelihood to score 700? Let me just ask this. What percentage of the people score 700? What is the likelihood that you're going to score 700? 10%, yes. What is the likelihood that you are going to, to score 740? What's the likelihood that you're going to score 740? 3%, right? 740 is 97 percentile. Or is it, I don't think it's 95. Nine, 730 is probably 95. 740 is 97, so 3 percentile. So statistically, you should stop studying if you're going to use the same method for being or for, for all. Right? If you're aiming for that statistically improbable score, is this correct? Being excited about her graduation. Um, Kesley could barely focus on a final exam. Great question. Send it to us. Uh, you, if you analyze it using the meaning, I'm not going to go in there. If this were an SC session, I would, but, but, uh, 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 yeah, think about what is being excited about our upcoming graduation. Talk about the present state versus what does the author intend to communicate? Okay. So, so th just think about it this way. Again, meaning, some of you are asking, does meaning apply to everything? It does, because that's the, the whole reason why we have grammar. Here is this thing that I want you to, to make sure that you do. And, and, and when you look at all of these things over here, choice A was a sentence structure issue that you had subjects missing. Okay. Choice B was grammatically correct, meaning was wrong. C, grammatically okay, meaning was wrong. Choice D was a modifier error which caused a meaning error over here, also over there. Could there be an option where the meaning is correct but grammatically incorrect? Absolutely, that would not be the correct choice. Yes, absolutely. Again, when you attend the essay webinar, you're going to see those all of those questions over here. The thing that I want to make sure that you understand is that you understand the difference between a 60th percentile guy and a 90th percentile guy. It's not so much about the grammatical concepts, it's about how you approach things. Okay. And, and, and a, a 90th percentile guy actually saw, uh, uh, approaches things in, in, a, in a different way. The second piece, how many of you were asking, okay, where are those 200 concepts? How many of you were asking that? Those 200 concepts, Rajat, that you talked about in GMAT SC? Yes. Can you see just in that question, there were five different sentence structures? Could you see that? Com five completely different sentence structures in that, in that question, yeah, right? Now, think of a matrix of various sentence structures along with the, the major error types. And can you kind of get to about 200 different concepts over there? 
because you have to apply those concepts, those, the major error types in the context of these sentence structures. You can't really not apply those without the context of these sentence structures. How do you master the split method? No, why would you use the split method? Here is my question. Who is better at splits? You or a computer? Who is better at splits? Which is pattern recognition. Is it you or a computer? Or when I say you are a machine, who's better at doing splits? A machine, hands down. Why would the GMAT test you on splits? If, as, if that's not the whole point of it. Isn't the splits method faster? Absolutely not. Who says that it's faster? Who says? Who says it's faster? Tell me. Who says the splits method is faster? I'm going to ask you two questions. Who says it's faster? B. Look at the last three months. Don't even go two years. Don't even account for the 2000 plus reviews that we have. Just the last three months. Look at the frequency of reviews that they have gotten in on GMAT Verbal and compare that to us on GMAT Club. Yeah, please don't. Yeah, I said don't compare us to Magush. For the first five years of their, like, their existence, they actually licensed someone else's course. When the person took it back, that's when they created their course. So, so you just don't compare us to Magush. We're very different companies, very different focuses. We have 10 SMEs which focus just on verbal. I, I don't know if Magush even has two. So, so, so yeah. If you want to understand the structure between us and, and any other company, go to our About Us place and look at the kind of people who we have on our payroll. How many subject matter experts, how many e-learning experts, how many technocrats do we have? And then how many tests do we serve? And compare that to Magush, compare that to Manhattan. And full-time resources, not part-time, where when you go to Manhattan, you see 30 instructors pretty much, all of them spend two hours a month. No, full-time experts. And you would really see the delta kind of how you should evaluate any company where when you're looking for a job and you say I want to go in a certain field look at how many people they've employed in that area to really say are they even invested in that space okay think about it does it make sense you want to apply to Adobe and if you want to build operating systems you should really see are they hiring people in bulk in that domain otherwise it's 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 just a, a fun practice for certain difficult questions, how do you understand meaning so fast? Um, there's too much to understand. Okay, if you don't understand the meaning, how can you get to the correct answer is my question. Um, how long does it take for you to tie your shoelace? Today? Let me ask this. How long does it take for you to tie your shoelace today? How long? A few seconds. How long did it take for you to tie a shoeless when you first tried it for the first ever time? Tens of minutes, not just minutes. The point is you will get better. You will get to a time where you'll take a few seconds over here. Okay. Can you give me some tips for time management on difficult questions? Can you tell me, prove to me you're at 80th percentile when you come there? We will help someone diagnose your specific problems for time management. But unless and until you get to that 80th percentile, for which you don't need time management, by the way, um, don't come to me with that, please. Build that ability first. What did we start this seminar with? What did we start this seminar with? What did we start this seminar with? Build ability first. All of those things next. Build ability first. Frankly, if you build ability, there's a 90% chance your timing issues will have been taken care of. But if they are not, then, then, you know, I will exactly know where I need to help you. 
Will it be more effective if we combine Manhattan Books with the EG Mart Comprehensive Course? No, it will not be. It's a recipe for disaster. If you want to go with Manhattan Books, just go with them. Don't bother about our course because ultimately you would come to us. So, so that part I know. Why do we use Adobe Connect instead of Webinar Jam and Zoom? How many polls does Adobe Connect allow, uh, does, does Zoom allow you to do? How many polls? How many different polls can you put on, on, on this? Just to tell you something, uh, this platform, Adobe Connect, costs about five times as much as Zoom does, about 20 times as much as Webinar Jam does. Okay, But it's a beautiful learning platform. Okay. So, how do you get to that 90th percentile? Let's kind of focus on finishing the webinar, guys, and then I'll be happy to answer these questions. When you get to that 90th percentile, is about having the right foundation, then using the right method, and then whatever gaps remain, you refine those over there. Okay. At each one of these points, you have to get feedback. Really, really important over there. Without feedback, you will not achieve that perfection. You will not get to that 90th percentile. Okay. And, and that's that's very important. If you don't get feedback, it's it's a bunch of video lessons. Okay. Um, just to really tell you, you know, when we make investments today, when we started our business, 70% of our investments were in content, 30% were in tech. Today, 70% of our investments are in tech. 30% are in foundation. Why? Because A, we have a lot of content already, but B, when it comes to this word perfection, it's the feedback that matters. Okay. And that feedback leads to that 90th percentile score. So how many feedback points do you get? In your learning concepts, we give you, just in the SC course, this is just for SC, you get 75 personalized feedback points. When you're learning application, just while learning application, this is not the cementing phase, guys you get 23 personalized feedback points. Now when you get into the cementing phase, you get about 50 personalized feedback points over there. And then the test readiness phase, that's about five personalized feedback points over here. Okay. Um, and this is where, how this personalized feedback helps. Now these are what I call a stage two feedback points. For some cases, stage one feedback points for another. Here's a guy, Jim Yi. He scored a V34. He used our course, by the way. He scored a V34, and what you see is he did really well in, in RC. SC and CR, he was still not following the methods. He came back to us and said, hey, I have a 700, I have a V34, help me. We diagnosed his problem. We looked at data on his platform. We, he wasn't doing pre-thinking. He wasn't following the meaning-based approach to the letter T. Okay, so these are the two areas we identified. We identified the causality, and then we, we actually uh, helped him improve this. This is from from 71st percentile to 96th percentile on verbal within 20 days over there. Okay. Um, 39th percentile in to 94th percentile in CR. Again, 63rd percentile to 94th percentile in our in, 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 in SC over here. Okay. This is what he said in his debrief. He says, I mean, you can see the title, trust the process. You don't trust the process, you don't get to it. His ESRs are attached, you can really see that. Now the beauty that you're gonna really see in this ESRs is that even though he was answering way more difficult questions, his time to answer questions actually went down when he started using the methods. Okay. Here's what he said. SC solid grammar can only help you solve easy and medium hard questions, but grammar plus meaning will carry all, you all the way up to V40 plus. Answer CR questions if there are no answer choices. Okay. Um, this guy got into both Booth and Columbia. He's, he's attending Booth right now. Okay. Um, someone said it, it matters if I'm not from India. Only 45% of our students are from India. So, so yes, go to our YouTube channel. You'll see pretty much debriefs by students from pretty much any country over there. You can access and download his, his, his ESRs from here. 
Okay. You can see some of these names. Jim is not an Indian. Adam's not an Indian. Okay. Someone was saying, how do you go from 400 to 700? Look at his success story, 490 to 710. Um, Kim, again, scored an 82nd percentile. Clearly the issue was, 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 was RC and to a certain extent SC as well over here. We helped her improve. Again, she wasn't following the reading strategies. We helped her improve to 93rd percentile in NRC, 99th percentile in SC. Not an Indian, by the way. Okay. Now, how does that, how is that feedback delivered over here? Let's kind of look at this. Here's a guy who, who scored V38. Now, certain interesting things over here in this case. When you look at this, if you were a paid student, you've probably gone through subject verb always singular. You don't see 58 minutes in his dashboard over here, in your dashboard. This file is not 58 minutes long. Why do you think this guy has 58 minutes over here and 55 minutes over here? Why do you think that? I mean, EG Math students, I mean, this file, you've gone through these files. They're more around 30 minutes. Yes, he had multiple reviews. What forced him to do that? This feedback that he got from the system saying, you've not done it well enough, my friend. You've got to fix those errors right then and there. Okay. Now this SV application over here, he scored 60%, but you can see he spent 47 minutes on it. He revised all the mistakes right then and there, even though the score doesn't show. He didn't attempt it, but he revised. The timing shows. Because of which he did well in the SV practice quiz over there. Okay. It's that feedback that comes in place that leads to perfection. Why? Otherwise, you have gaps. Gaps go forward. They get amplified. Verb tenses. Very similar story. The scores don't change. No, if you get 100%, then you've proven that you've gotten 100%. And, and the scores don't change. Why? Because sometimes people come back and, and, and essentially they just want to review a portion of the file uh, two months down the line. We don't want the system to change this to say, hey, you've not done this file. Okay. This allows for more effective revision um, when to retain the max score. Now, this piece over here, you can really see again 83% and 80%, but you can see how long he took. He caught the feedback from system. 98 minutes on conditional verb, difficult concept over here. But then he scored 64% over here in the verbs practice quiz. Didn't take that long, but he spent time revising those questions. Why? Because we looked at his quiz results screen and he had bookmarked these two questions over here. And you can see what are the difficulty levels and, uh, and then how long he took. All of this is tracked in the platform right then and there. Because he took that feedback seriously, uh, he actually scored very well in this file. This, you can't see the screenshot over here, but he scored 100% in the official quizzes over here. Okay. So he, for him, he says, for me, the biggest thing was the application of concepts. He took the GMAT twice, uh, three times. He says, my, my concepts weren't bad during the first couple of attempts, but I lacked the knowledge of that application. And the application, which is the meaning-based approach, is that game changer. So with that, um, you know, I think I pretty much covered everything that I wanted to cover in this webinar. Um, I want to thank you guys for joining, but... It, if you're an EG Math student, I want to make sure you have that study plan. I want to make sure you understand those onboarding sessions. I want to make sure you understand the intensity you need uh, to, to, to get there. Many of you are aiming for that 730 score. 730 score requires that you make some sacrifices. It requires that you be diligent. It requires that you do course correction right then and there. Why? Because it, it ensures that there are no gaps. And trust me, this is not easy. Your brain will tell you, hey, move on, move on to the next concept. But if the system's telling you, you've got to revise, please revise. And, and it's, it's that mental toughness that, that makes you worthy of that 90th percentile, that 97th percentile score. Doesn't that happen? Your brain tells you to move forward when the system tells you to revise. Right? He says, let me just finish the next concept, then I'll come back. Do not do that. That mental toughness, that regularity is needed if you want to get to that 95th, 97th percentile. Okay. If you're a free trial student, start with a Sigma X mock and then work with an expert over there. All right. So, 
Can you buy just the SC course? No, we don't. If you want to buy the course for just for SC, you know, request a one month course. Uh, we look at your scores. If you just need one month, if you just need SC, then we can we can we make an exception. But otherwise, no. Um, with that, just to summarize, here are the session files. You can download the PDF over here. And again, I, we will be posting a very similar SC question to what we had today on our YouTube channel. So uh, definitely come attempt that question and then look for the solution over there. But just to summarize, to score 730, you know, and to earn a scholarship, uh, you, sorry, to earn a scholarship, get to that score of 730. To get to that, build ability. To build ability in the relevant amount of time, take the study, create your own study plan. For each subsection, understand which stage of learning you are in and use feedback to make sure that you achieve perfection in the first go, to make sure that you don't take the test multiple times. Okay. Do we have something similar for executive assessment? Unfortunately not. Now you do the course, you will do well in executive assessment, but not something specific over there. But while I, I share the PDF and a few other things, guys, um, uh, for those of you, if you can give me some feedback on the session, that would be wonderful. For those of you who want the study plan link, once again, here is the study plan link on the top uh, uh, in the se second tab over here. But feedback on the open-ended question, guys, that would be really good. Should you be attending onboarding if you attended the session today? I think you will for, for two reasons. One is, you know, yes, you got a lot of it today. Uh, but but when you attend onboarding, you also get to know the GMAT strategy team. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good to know who are the people who are going to be supporting you. Okay. Um, with regards to the upcoming session, um, let me just share the PDF. And, and then here are the upcoming free sessions. Uh, you are in your undergrad, so would 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 it be would giving the GMAT be a waste of time? No, the score is valid for five years. Why would giving the GMAT be a waste of time? No, it won't be. Okay, uh, a lot of our students do that. I mean, if you go to our YouTube channel, I think um, the, if you ask this question in the Q and A pod, um, then 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 I'd be happy to share some students who asked it. one such student? I think a couple of other Arjun has another student who. Uh, in the last couple of months, you know, Asset was scored 770, Arjun scored 740. They both just graduated. The beauty of taking the GMAT early on is is that you can then focus just on your career, and then you know, in three four years, you apply. Is six months enough? Most people, you know, 200 hours is enough. That's the beauty of a personalized course, guys. You know, you're not studying everything; you're studying what you need. The time, no, so in PSP, you have time allocated not just to sections, but also for cementing, okay? Um, whatever time you use in, that's there in PSP, add about 20% more to it. Remember, I talked about that 90th percentile ability, 60% learning, 40% practice. Out of that 40% practice, you're doing, you know, um, uh, about 70% of that practice, which is accounted for already in there. So, so yeah. Is Sigma X mock tougher than the official GMAT mock? Verbal is very precise. Quant's probably slightly tougher it's than, than the official mock, but it's very similar to what the actual test is because the official mock on the quant slide is slightly easier. Is getting into a deferred MBA program a lot more uh, uh, difficult than uh, than getting into an MBA? Yes, it is. So, so. Um, Here's something that I would say. Think about it this way, right? A deferred MBA program, a Harvard offers two plus two, there are Columbia offers one, ISB offers one. So I'm going to keep ISB aside because ISB is not as difficult. Um, but let's talk about Harvard and Columbia here. Why would Harvard and Columbia take you uh, if you're just graduating? They, Unless and until you've shown some quality, there's no reason for them to offer you admission just on the basis of, their, of your GMAT score. Doesn't mean you shouldn't take the GMAT right now, but don't think you if you've been like a regular guy and 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 if you have a 770 and you apply to harvard they would put you no on the other hand if you've had uh, you know uh, if you're someone who's been a, done really well in in in, in your graduation uh, in your school graduation if you have a, a significant amount of other projects that you've done while in school 
uh, then Harvard would give you admission to that two plus two. So deferred MBA, does that help? So it's the point is if you don't have work X, you, you know, you're only providing one component unless you substitute something else in addition to the GMAT for that work X, it's difficult to get admission. Uh, would you suggest the GMAT online or the offline exam? I am a big fan of the GMAT online exam and especially, um, f how many of you have seen my video on, 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 on GMAT online, the recent video on our YouTube channel? I, I, I shared two videos on, on uh, YouTube channel. Let me just put in a poll question. So in that I, I distill the differences between on, uh, between the, the at-home GMAT and, and the in-center GMAT, which is kind of what you're talking about online or offline. It's, both the exams are online, by the way. One is in-center, the other one is in your house. I prefer the in-your-house test because I think I don't like to wear a mask. I, I, I love my table and chair. For me, it's just a mock test. Um, and and if you, as long as you can get a stable internet connection, you should be great. I know people have had, they've had a lot of horror stories about the online GMAT get publicized, uh, but trust me, and if you again watch interviews on, on our channel, pretty much every student that is there is taking the online GMAT right now, and they've had beautiful experiences. So so that one or two percent of the cases, they get amplified a whole lot. In fact, uh, just last Monday, we posted uh, a student who went from 50th to 98th percentile. For, for him, what had happened was that uh, the proctor was so generous, the guy couldn't get a proper network, and he was in Kerala, he couldn't get a proper network on, on the ground floor, or which in the US we call our first floor of the house, so the proctor helped him and said, why don't you go to the second floor, which is the first floor in India, and, and, and do that, and, and so the proctor was, I mean, such stories don't go out over there, if you watch that interview, you'll see that. The second thing is, I think it's, it's starting with 8th of April, um, uh, the date again is on, on, um, on our YouTube channel, uh, GMAT online is, is 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 where when it includes the AWA and the the section order selection. There's one of the big things that's happening is which a lot of people don't know, is it's moving from the Pearson View platform to the Examity platform for tests. And the Examity platform, in my opinion, is way more. It's it's beautiful to take an online proctored test. So, so I am super 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 excited about the online GMAT. Can you use scrap paper? No, you can't. Can you provide the link where you purchase the EGMAT course? Just go to our website. I mean, that's how you'd go. Okay. All right, guys. Questions in the Q&A part. I'm going to move this away. Questions in the Q&A part over here. Uh, study plan over here. And uh, and and again, let me just put in the success stories over here for those of you who want to get to our YouTube channel. Again, remember, we will have the 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 question, uh, the SC question in there. So if you want to download Jim's ESR, here is how you can go download. Oh, this is his uh, YouTube interview actually, not his ESR. But his GMAT Club debrief is over here I have a great question it says what's the best competitor to EGMAT the one that pushes you to improve private tutors those are the best competitors to EGMAT so for us if you go to our YouTube channel you probably see a video which talks about it's a 2019 video but it talks about where we are going um, 10 years ago we wanted to be better than a classroom course Four years ago, we were already there. Now we want to be better than working with a private tutor. So, but great question, Raghav. Shashank says, do you think starting the EGMAT course a year prior to taking the G, uh, to GMAT is a bad idea? Learning, <laughs> studying for the GMAT a year prior to taking the GMAT is a bad idea. So yes, taking the EGMAT course is a bad idea. I mean, most people need three months. I'll be very frank. So, 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 you know, if you're taking the EGMAT course now, um, then, then, you know, take the GMAT in three months. Why do you need a year, Shashank? This, I, I am, I'm a big believer in, in doing things in an intensive manner. I'm a big proponent of hit training. So, uh, say yes. 
Um, yes, Gmail Online says you can send your unofficial. Uh, yeah, how about it? What's the question, Maverick, uh, about unlimited score report sending? How do you go about doing that? Um, I think we have this on our YouTube channel. Let me actually get you to. The YouTube throw. Hold on. Just my bad. Um, let me just share with you. How do you send your score report? If you watch this video, and by the way, for those of you who want to see how I look, this video really says that. If you watch this video towards the end, you can see how do you go about sending it to unlimited schools. Namrata says, if there's no scratch paper, how do you solve for quant section? You have a whiteboard. Okay. I have another video for that. So, um, You have a whiteboard uh, uh, on the online GMAT. Here is the whiteboard. All right. How does it happen? You should have that in the video. Um, my study plan lists one week for stage one. Is that correct? It should be, Gillian, if, if your initial ability is high enough. Uh, so so if, if that's the case. Uh, write to the support team if you still have doubts over there, but if you tell me your ability scores, I can tell you. Should I take the 7 GMAT test and send the best score if a 10 to 20 point increase can change the scholarship amount? So by the way, I hope you don't have to take the test seven times, Molo. Uh, 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 by the way, so so so, uh, uh, if you do test readiness properly, you should achieve your target GMAT score in the first or the second go. Is 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 what we what I want to tell you. So um, so that's kind of where I would want you to be, uh, not 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 seven times, okay. Uh, but but you know, does improving the GMAT score have an impact on scholarships? Absolutely. Let me actually share an interview with you uh, of a student who scored a 730, uh, got rejected by pretty much every school. This is a recent experience over here. And then he, she improved to a 760 and and, and she got a $50,000 scholarship. So, so here is her interview. Her name is Dipinti Ghoshal. So, um, so, but yeah, don't take the GMAT seven times, please. Is there any way to understand scores on an official GMAT practice test to figure out the ability? <sighs> I don't know why the GMAT won't do this. Is there a way I can make a guess? Uh, uh, it's not going to be super precise, but I like a, I mean, I know enough to to make a guess uh, uh, over there. Um, it takes a lot more time to do it, Raghav. Is there a way? Yes, but it takes a lot more time. Then you've got to analyze certain questions. Um, you've got to look at the statistical basis for those questions. It, it, it's a lot of effort. Yeah, but it can be done. Vijay says the ESR subsectional ability gives uh, scores in percentiles, but wouldn't the 6 to 51 score be a better measure? No, they're the same. It's one to one mapping. So how does how can one be better? I mean, um, uh, Numbers in English and and, and numbers in, 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 in Mandarin are numbers still. It's, they're still numbers in the same way. It's just, they're just scales. It's the same way as actually, you know, the better parallel is talking about temperature in Celsius versus Kelvin scale. You know, 32 degrees Fahrenheit has zero degrees Celsius. Both of them, they communicate the same thing. That's kind of the same. Where can you get one-to-one -one mapping? Oh, very simple. Here is the mapping over here. You can pretty much get it anywhere. But here is the mapping. 
Molo says I'm getting seven in the official mark. That's great, Molo. That's wonderful. Just need to figure out where you need where you need help. Uh, take a sigma x mark. That probably is what will tell you where you're where you're facing issues, and then go from there. Okay. With that, I want to thank everyone for joining me today. I think there are no other questions that are there. Um, uh, it was a pleasure hosting this session, and I look forward to seeing you in the geometry session tomorrow. All right. Good luck and have a great day.